My name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding, and I'm delighted, delighted to welcome you to uh, today's uh, class of 1950 uh, presentation. The class of 1950, uh, the graduating class of Dartmouth of 1950, uh, was the first class that had the, I would say, the honor and the privilege uh, to spend four years, and it was the first class that spent four years under President John Sloan Dickey. And it's through the generosity of that class uh, that we are able to conduct this program every year. And under it, we bring a very distinguished individual involved in foreign affairs uh, to the campus for several days, close to a week. And the idea being that it gives us the opportunity to have that individual meet with students, with classes, with the public, uh, and more than just simply you know, giving a speech and then and taking off the next day. So I really want to express my thanks and the thanks of the Dickey Center to the class of 1950. And there are four wonderful individuals and one spouse uh, sitting here. And I would just ask if they would just stand so we can recognize you. <laughs> you know, John Sloan Dickey uh, told uh, the students at Dartmouth uh, to learn about the major issues of foreign affairs, but equally important to go out and do something, you know, about them. And these individuals have lived their lives exactly uh, in that way. Today is in a very important anniversary. There's a lot going on, you know, right now. This is the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, this year also marks 50 years of the Cuban Revolution and 60 years of the Chinese Revolution. So there are many, many important events. And our speaker today is going to speak about uh, another revolution in, in Nicaragua and why he believes that that revolution uh, has been lost. Um, he is a very outstanding individual. I've had the pleasure to spend uh, close to a day with him now and his wonderful wife, Gertrudis, and I'm talking about uh, Sergio Ramirez. Um, but uh, he is both a writer and a politician for much of his life, but also a politician and a writer uh, for other parts of his life. But he is a wonderful combination of you know, these two um, professions, if you will. And he is a Nicaraguan, as I said. Uh, he is spending uh, this term at uh, Harvard, uh, where he is uh, uh, teaching in the Latin American Studies program for the fall of this year. Uh, he was vice president of Nicaragua from 1984 to 1990 during the period of the Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional, the FLSL, FSLN uh, government. And in 1995, uh, he broke from that organization to form the Movimiento de Renovación Sandinista, the MRS. And I'm sure that that will be, you know, the major subject of, of, of his discussion today, uh, that process and why he broke with it. Uh, he has written many, many books. Um, I won't mention each of them, but they've been translated into 15 languages, and he has received many awards, uh, including the uh, Premio Internacional Dashiell Hammett and the Premio Internacional de Novelle um, Alfaguara. And please join me in giving a very warm Dartmouth welcome to Sergio Ramirez. <laughs> Uh, thanks first uh, Ambassador Kenneth Jalowitz for this kind invitation and thanks to Marisa Navarro who has brought me here too and I am really delighted to be the, here with you 
my lecture would be, as the ambassador said, about uh, my vision on the Nicaraguan revolution to which I was a protagonist. When I some five years ago, in April 2004, a man was stabbed mortally in a cantina fight in the district of Morimbo in Masaya. The victim, Manuel Salvador Monge El Chirizo, was 55 years old, the assailant, a teenager. According to the police account, the incident that led to the death was the result of a dispute about which of the two was more of a man. The teenager was unaware of the caliber of the man whose life he had taken, unaware that El Chirizo had been a member of the command unit headed by Eden Pastora that sensationally captured the National Palace in Managua on 22 August 19. 78, one of the decisive events in the fall of the Somoza's dynasties, the dictatorships in Nicaragua. An anonymous hero, a hero of the revolution that triumphed on July 19, 1979, poor all his life and now forgotten, had fallen in an obscure quarrel between drunkards. But what has become of the revolution El Chirizo and so many others fought for? A traveler who returned to Nicaragua after these 30 years, or who arrived there for the first time, would be forced to wonder if there had ever been a revolution in my country. There are no visible traces, except for the increasingly confused rhetoric of the Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional. And worse than that, Nicaragua has never experienced such unequal distribution of wealth, nor has so many poor people who scratch a living beneath the circling vultures in the rubbish heaps of Acawalinka. The poor are inescapable. They flock around the traffic lights in Managua Street, selling everything from costume jewelry and contraband goods to jungle animals that have fled the predation of the timber mafias. When night falls, they return to flimsy dwellings improvised with rubbish and discarded packaging, a slum which multiply by the day so that the city, far from the gleaming lights of its magical shopping malls, looks like a huge refugee camp. And where are the revolution's ideals that once captured the imagination of people, common people like El Chirizo? Disappear under an avalanche of despair, frustration, ideological disarray, empty rhetoric, and forgetting. 70% of the Nicaraguan's current population is under 30 years old, a very young country. Now the living memory of the revolution among the young is precarious or altogether absent. The judgment of those who live through it all, meanwhile, are as polarized as ever. A radiant dawn for some, a dark night for others. Nicaragua was alone in the continent in stubbornly proclaiming the right of a small country to political independence free of the traditional dominion of the United States. This dominion had been a consistent theme in Nicaraguan history since the filibuster William Walker proclaimed himself president of the country in 1855. It was made manifest through repeat military intervention and lasted until the end of the Somoza's family reign. The insistent def defense of sovereignty shadowed this long era of external domination. In the 80s, Nicaragua's search for a form of national redemption became part of a decade of extreme confrontation and aggression during the presidency of Ronald Reagan. The Sandinist revolution last an entire decade of illusions and culminated with Daniel Ortega's electoral defeat in 1990 when I also ran with him as candidate to the vice president. Violeta Chamorro won the elections amid the circumstances 
of a devastating war that was coming to an end. Defeat was very painful to those of us who had taken part in overthrowing the dictatorship of Anastasio Somoza 10 years before, because we were not just losing an election. The defeat meant the collapse of a political project of profound transformation which had been frustrated by a war that dog fought between the Sandinista army and the army of the Contras was mainly a war between us and the Reagan administration. We could say that when we lost the election, Reagan won the war, not in the military battlefield, but in the political battlefield. The country was in rubble and the economic collapse. Thus, social welfare programs, land reform, literacy and public health also lost the war. Dreams were defeat. While war was the main cause of the collapse of the revolution, although we certainly cannot excuse our own mistakes. First of all, our wrong appreciation that the initial revolutionary fervor would last. At first, we had the support of all those who were against the dictatorship, even the wealthy. But this general support evaporated as we deepened structural reforms and raised the radical tone in our speeches. The country was divided. We lost the middle class confidence and peasants, our main source of support, were also divided. Very soon we had a peasant war because the Contra's social base were peasants, very much afraid of the changes the revolution proposed. And the Reagan administration certainly took advantage of that. When we called for elections in 1990, we had already lost them, except we didn't know. Elections were a sort of plebiscite against the war, and people decide that while in, while in power, the Sandinist Front couldn't guarantee peace. That is one way to see the results of that election, the loss of power and revolution and a revolution that was lost. But it can also be seen from another perspective, democracy. For the first time in Latin America history, a revolution that had come to power by the force of arms was leaving power by the force of votes. This was a new lesson we all had to learn. Democracy had won, although democracy was not something we, a revolutionary power, had always put in first place. First came social transformations and changes in domestic economic structure. And at first, we believed there had to be a party to lead those changes without delay, our party. But at the end, it was not what the majority of the people were thinking. Reality went on teaching us lessons, the first of them being war. We were a divided country because the revolutionary project had lost the initial consent, as I already said. At first, we proclaimed we didn't need elections. But in 1983, only three years after the triumph of the revolution, we were already organizing the first election, seeking for a peaceful way out of a war that had already exploded. We won that election. Now this other 1990 election also sought a political way out of a war which made impossible for the country to move on. We no harvest, a critical shortage in oil and power supply because of the terrorist attacks. Exports at their lowest, inflation at its highest, and lack of general goods and supply, but mainly the military draft which became increasingly unpopular. We paid homage to democracy by accepting the electoral results without arguing, but inside the Sandinist party, some thought that our immediate task was to return to power at any cost or, or by any means. Pretending to return to power was logical. That is what we were now an opposition force for. <coughs> but the problem lay in the concept of at any cost and by any means. This meant that we didn't have to be loyal to the democratic system we ourselves had created, and there was a will to undermine Mrs. Chamorro's presidency with all kinds of obstacles, strikers, riots artificially set up. 
descending from the feet at the poles, was still a much disciplined and well-organized force able to create disturbances in the streets. The other issue was that to return to power, the Sandinist Front needed economic resources. So before leaving power, it organized the transference of state goods and national resources to the defeat party. But actually, those resources never reached the party, but stay on the road instead. Many new personal fortunes rose from those resources. That is what is known as the piñata, a cheerful distribution of state goods among a number of high rank members of the Sandinist Front. None of those people were expelled from the party, nor were they sent to trial, not even were they subject to any disciplinary measure for their ethical violations, and that caused an even worse collapse, <coughs> that of moral values. The Sandinist Front had always been a party that preached personal detachment to wealth and material goods. When it lost moral credit, it truly lost everything. Those of us who opposed the embarrassing transgression lost the battle, but in years to come, that initial opposition will become the seed for the splitting of the Sandinist Front. We created in 1995 the Movimiento Renovador Sandinista because it was impossible to carry out such a battle inside the old party, a battle in favor of ethics and democracy. That was the first phase of the piñata. The second phase took place when the new government, complying with the new economic policies of the International Monetary Fund, began a quick privatization process of state enterprises and goods. At the time, more than half of the economy was in states' hands. Since the revolution had na nationalized dozens of industrial, agricultural, transport, and trade enterprises. But the new government could not privatize then against the will of the Sandinist Front which dominated unions and social organizations able to paralyze the country. So an agreement was reached. 30% of all privatized companies will become, will become workers' property. But again, all these goods and resources which represented that 30% never reached the workers' hands but were kept by some powerful people within the Sandinist Front files, and those who took part in both phases of the piñata are now prosperous entrepreneurs who know we well how to take advantage of power to facilitate their business operations. Since 1990, Daniel Ortega persistently presented himself as presidential candidate and was defeated again in 1996 by Arnoldo Alemán, chief of the Liberal Party, and in 2001 by Enrique Bolaños from the same Liberal Party. Until finally, in 2006, he fulfilled his old desire to return to power, winning the election with 38% of the vote. He won because there had been a conspiracy to reform the Constitution to allow him to win in a single round with such a precarious majority. The second round was in this way not necessary and so was the requisite to obtain more than 50% of the vote to be elected president. And such thorough reform of the Constitution was only possible because of Ortega's deal with Arnoldo Alemán, the corrupt leader of the Liberal Party, who in 2003 was sentenced to 20 years in prison for money laundry according to illicit acts committed during his presidency. That pact allowed other core reforms to the Constitution. Those reforms drafted in 2000 and then again in 2005 were conceived to define a distribution of power between Ortega and Alemán and to gain tight control of state entities. <coughs> it facilitated submissiveness of the courts of justice to the personal will of both signatories as well as submissiveness of the electoral system and the controller's office. The Supreme Court of Justice was extended to 17 members, a scandalous number for a poor country of hardly 5 million people, with the sole purpose of distributing positions among the unconditional. The question is now, 
Is it the same Sandinist Front that fought and won the revolution? Is it the same Sandinist Front that took the National Palace with the participation of humble men like El Chirizo? Are we in a second stage of the revolution of the 80s? Is there still a revolution going on in Nicaragua? Daniel Ortega put up with successive defeat, raising an intransigent battle flag in favor of the poorest and exclude, not giving in his rhetoric except when he was advised to lower his tongue or keep silent by his electoral campaign strategist. At the same time, he managed to articulate the Sandinist Front around him based on personal rather than past ideological loyalties, while he got rid of of the opponents through period of purges, mainly of those who threatened his leadership. But none of that would have been enough without the political pact he subscribed with Arnoldo Alemán. Political pacts among caudillos are nothing new in Nicaraguan history. In 1950, for similar reasons, General Anastasio Somoza Garcia, founder of the dynasty, signed the Pact of the Generals on behalf of the Liberal Party with General Emiliano Chamorro, who signed it on behalf of the Conservative Party. Beside the distribution of positions and parliament, parliament seats, that pact forested a constitutional reform that allowed Somoza to present his candidacy for a re-election in 1956, when he was shot by the young poet Rigoberto Lopez Perez. As I said, by means of the 2000 Pact, a constitutional reform was passed, reducing to 35% the votes required to win in a first round. In turn, Ortega allowed the courts of justice to release Aleman from prison, declaring him valid to the Narian, that is, disabled by senile decrepitude, as an unusual measure that can only be explained by the judge's submissiveness. Now, thanks to the same pact, the Supreme Court of Justice has dismissed his case. It is, in the only, it is the only known case where a criminal convict leads a political party. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ortega got the unconditional support of Cardinal Obando y Bravo, an old adversary of the revolution and epitome of the most conservative position in the 80s. Now, he's a member of the government appointed as head of an office called Reconciliation Commission, intended to extend official influence in the countryside and to gain votes for Ortega's re-election. Ortega has, has also allied with all the leaders of the national resistance, the Contras, that fought Sandinism in the 80s, head and financed by the CIA under President Reagan auspices. For example, Jaime Morales Carazo, a member of the Contra Supreme Leadership that operated from Miami is now Ortega's vice president. Some see these alliances like a boast, a boast of political ability or as the cool application of, of a pragmatic vision. I have reason to see them rather as the consequence of the renouncement of those principles that wage so much in the epic of the revolution now replaced by an ambition of personal power, role of all ethical consideration. A power that no longer serves a transcendent project, but only resembles the traditional power in our domestic history. Within that dual confusion in which a Fleming leftist speech coexists with core concession to the most intransigent right, to the point of identifying itself with it, the banning of therapeutic abortion, even when it means saving a mother's life recently ratified in the penal code reform, becomes a cruel and painful example. Therapeutic abortion, allowed by the Nicaraguan legislation since the middle of the 19th century, even before the 1893 liberal revolution, has become a crime punished with seven years of prison. This probe his apparent conversion to militant Catholicism, but not the Catholicism of liberation theology, but the regress regressive Catholicism of Cardinal Obando, who persecuted the priests commit to the revolution in the 80s. The Sandinist Front 
is in a spirit and nature very distant from the one that conquered power in 1979. It is very different from the Sandinist Front that along an entire decade fought fiercely to impose a popular program and that in spite of errors, false conception and multiple obstacles was inspired by that mystic with deep ethical upholds that has now been replaced by ambition for personal power and greed. The return of the other Sandinist Front to, of this other Sandinist Front to government has not meant the restoration of those principles that are fading. And the project is neither the same because its articulation now responds to purposes that are no longer revolutionary. Therefore, differences are abysmal in both senses. Before, wars corresponded to facts. Fidelity to principles demanded disdain of material goods as a rule of behavior for the guerrilla. Now, reality separates facts from words. Thus, today, there are enough capitalists in the Sandinist front files and truly rich ones, their money obtained through corruption to deny the aggressiveness of a radical speech in favor of the poor. Such a speech drops words like dead fruits, lacking the substance it once had plenty of credibility. In spite of the diatribes against imperialism, and in spite of the fact that the International Monetary Fund is the imperialism privileged financial instruments in accordance with Ortega's wars, his government signs agreement with the fund which obliged to maintain monetary discipline and the same structural adjustment program that the previous rightist government signed in turn. In the same way, while loudly attacking the free trade treaty with the United States signed by the previous government, it strictly complies with its application. I don't believe it is convenient for the country to break up with the International Monetary Fund or to condemn the Free Trade Treaty with the United States or to return to confiscatory practices. We don't need the artificial climate of hostility and distrust that vicious rhetoric creates inside and outside a country prostrated by the chronic illness of a poverty that words can't cure. So I just demand coherence between words and facts. The other remarkable example of this alienation is the persistence which Ortega resists a democrat democracy that demands respect and, and invigoration of institutions which he has placed at his personal service instead, ignoring that the effectiveness of institutions rely on power alternability not in continuism, not in the power of the caudillo. And caudillismo, the one man's rule, is the oldest political institution in Latin America and the most evil one. Once, in a speech he gave in Managua during the first Congress of the Sandinist Front, Lula da Silva, who was not yet president of Brazil, said that the left's great mistake had been to create an ideological difference between bourgeois democracy and proletarian democracy, when truly there is only one class of democracy. In doing so, the left had acquired bad prestige presenting itself as an enemy to democracy, which meant to voting and choosing your leaders. This is a speech I never forgot. And for me, it marks the great difference among the leaders of the Latin American left in power today in different countries. Whoever thinks that a democracy that allows alternability in power is an outdated system is still thinking in terms of bourgeois democracy and thinking that by using the same bourgeois democracy mechanism, some sort of proletarian democracy can be built. They are looking toward the past. They speak of sweeping institutions and establishing a new system that should rise from the ashes of the old system. But in that new system, the leader or caudillo should remain where he is forever because he joins himself indispensable. And in order to do so, he needs a constitution that allows him to be reelected as many times as it is necessary or as many times as he wants. Now, this is not a new system. This is the same one we have recurrently lived with since the 19th century, 
a source of bad habits, corruption, confrontation, violence, and poverty. Again, we face the irreplaceable leader, the enlightened one who knows what the country needs. But the irreplaceable leader is not an idea of the left. It comes from the darkest bottom of the Latin American history, from the deepest abyss of patriarchal society where the landowner became the military leader and then the perpetual president. There is nothing new in the proposal of an owner of power forever. This regressive vocation has led to the creation in Nicaragua of the citizen power councils after President Chavez model, an instrument to dire for direct or participate of uh, direct or participative <coughs> democracy destined to amend the function of representative or formal democracy, which collides with the old ghost of proletarian democracy that still rattles its chains. This citizen power council, headed by Ortega's wife, Rosario Murillo, organized district by district, neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, end up in what is called the National Cabinet, a supreme power pulled out of a magician's hat in which Council's popular delegates would sit beside the minister who, as in Venezuela, are officially called Minister of People, Power, or Citizen Power. Downstream, the Council have decisive and supervisory faculties on a multitude of political and administrative matters, which range from authorizing credits for the Zero Usury Program to approving beneficiaries of the Zero Hunger Program that donates cow, pigs, poultry, and farming implements to rural families. They can also demand the removal of a public officer at all levels, and it has been officially announced that they intend to have voluntary surveillance functions in the territories complementary to those of the police corps. These committees are not pluralistic entities accessible to the diverse sectors, sectors of the population. The citizens that integrate them are all militants or supporters of the government's party are are controlled by the same political secretaries or local party commissaries. A net need with the same threat and the same notes that could sing unnecessary Buddhism because it ensures control and long-term power. The old party of the 80s with the collective leadership has been replaced by a unique and personal will, the will of Daniel Ortega and that of his wife, Rosario Murillo. Once again, as always along the history of Latin America, the family is the mold in which a political party shapes itself and shapes the state. Ortega is arming himself with long-term instrument, all those that any caudillo needs, as has happened to many, so many times in the history of, Ni of Nicaragua and Latin America. The citizen power councils are a prop, but if he wants to stay, as it seems, he will also need the constitutional reforms that allow his him successive reelections. For someone who has been elected with 38% of the votes while having a polarized majority against, the search for consent should be a necessary act of sound judgment. But all of Ortega's actions tend to move away from consent and to polarize society again, starting with intention, his intention to continue in power. We need to remember that re-election and family governments have been the most disastrous bad habit of Nicaragua politics and have always had tragic consequences. If nothing less, it was the cause of the Sandinist revolution that overthrew the Somoza's family. In the kingdom of past illusions, where the idea of the eternal revolution prevailed, consent was not judged, always necessary. But today, an obstinate vision, as this does nothing to do but to ignore the landscape or take it for another that no longer exists, in today's landscape, society claims the right to plurality and dissidence, to free expression of thought, to diverse sources of, of information, to transparency in state performance, to accountability, to the existence of social organizations and parties that don't respond to a unique interest, to whatever form the fabrics of democracy. 
This landscape is the result of many years of struggle and experiences that highlight a democratic progress marked by the same plurality in which a multitude of interests and opinions moves today and which cannot be concerted both in their diversity. Therefore, a unique political behavior dictated from power has a scarce possibilities to be imposed as long as society continues to have its current instruments, independent media, civil society organizations, political parties, and entrepreneurs of all sizes, the smaller one being the most numerous in Nicaragua. But also, of the one of the most visible institutional inheritances of the revolution is the existence of a national army and a national police that function as modern and professional entities in compliance with the political constitution. We must not forget that army and police forces were bound in a single corrupt and sanguinary repressive force under Somoza and that the revolution swept that away from its roots. Both institutions have won now the prestige that they enjoyed in Nicaragua proclaiming their distance from any kind of submission, be it a party, a family, or an oligarchy, and without any double speech like the army's commander in chief have declared recently. This is also part of the new landscape and it removes one of the traditional and fundamental pieces of caudillismo, the unconditional support of the armed and security force to a person. But the police is now under assault since Ortega is trying to debilitate its neutrality by converting it in a personal instrument of repression. The destruction of the professional police to use it at the personal will of the caudillo will signal that we are again under, the, under a dictatorship and that citizen safety under the law is lost. But there are other ominous signals that predict the somber future of democracy in Nicaragua. The electoral fraud perpetrated in the municipal election in November last year, for example, which snatched Managua and some 40 cities from the opposition. The electoral machinery is under Ortega's absolute control and he wouldn't doubt in using it to ensure election now the constitution has been surpressively reformed last month. The constitution of Nicaragua prohibited presidential elections. Since Ortega doesn't have the necessary votes in the National Assembly to reform the constitution, he used the bizarre expedient of ordering his loyal magistrate in the Supreme Court to rule that the article of the Constitution that prohibited him to be reelected was unconstitutional, since a different article established that all citizens are equal under the law. The court vote the resolution within minutes, and this is the first case in which a Constitution is declared unconstitutional. Another signal is the rapid accumulation of economic power in his own hands and in those of members of his family taking advantage of the resources from oil provided by President Chavez of Venezuela. This provision of oil is made by means of soft credits, but that money doesn't go to the state coffers, but to a private company under the control of Ortega and his family. Thus, the history of Nicaragua again enters a decisive crossroad. It will have to gather all conscious democratic resources to safeguard us from any new dictatorship. A tenacious struggle will have to be fought to preserve the constitutional character of the armed and security forces, to rescue the independence of the judicial system, to impede continuism, reelection, or family succession, to move institutions away from the caudillo's shade. In short, what we must preserve are the dreams that inspired such unsung heroes as Manuel, as Manuel Salvador Monge Lopez El Chirizo. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I know during your speech you were talking about um, the movement towards caudillismo in, um, in Latin America, and I was just wondering what, uh, what you think of the situation that's unraveling in Honduras right now, in terms of the lie and all that. 
Well, Presi President Chavez uh, is the leader of a group of country in which uh, political ch changes are going on, Bolivia, Ecuador, Nicaragua. Um, but those are not the only countries that belong to what is nowadays called the new left or the left of the 20th cent 21 century. There are other countries like Brazil, for example, who has uh, another vision about the changes in, in Latin America. For me, the most important difference between the, these two groups uh, would be the will of the leaders of those countries to be reelected or not to be reelected, to respect alternativity, empower the free will of the people to choose their, their presidents. Um, Lula, Lula, President Lula da Silva is one of the most popular presidents in, in Latin America. And in Brazil, he has 80% uh, of uh, support on the part of the population. But after two terms in power, which is what the Constitution allowed him to stay, he's uh, uh, abandoning power now, um, permitting free election to take place in the country without him being a candidate. That is marked for me a very important uh, differences, uh, difference. Uh, President Chavez has reformed the Constitution in order to stay there forever, as uh, well as Daniel Ortega, that has reformed the Constitution without, uh, in the terms I explained, without a term. And uh, it has not to do with democracy. And I think that social changes most have to do with democracy. For me, it is the, 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 the difference. I'm just curious how in the world Daniel Ortega got Cardinal Obando y Bravo on his side. It is a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really don't know, but there are many rumors in, 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 in Nicaragua, uh, gossip, political gossip. Uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, uh, someone that uh, is uh, like a song of, like a song of Cardinal Lovando, the, who is at the same time the president of the Electoral Commission, uh, has uh, became rich in a few years. He's a very rich man. He has uh, private planes. He has uh, mansions in Costa Rica, uh, big, farm la big, big farms in Nicaragua, and so on. And people links. Uh, the conversion of uh, Cardinal Obando to the side of Ortega to, to, to the present situation of his uh, political song. But I would say it is political gossip. But the fact is that he has changed very abruptly to the side of, of, of Ortega. Hi, uh, how is your, um, how do you think your message of sort of disillusionment is currently received uh, in Nicaragua? Or how do people, re you know, react to you? You know, uh, the majority, the immense majority of the people is against uh, the possibility of a new dictatorship against reelection. 60% uh, of the population and <coughs> to give us political sign, they vote massively against uh, the candidates for, of Ortega in the municipal elections last year, but there was a dozen enormous uh, electoral fraud, enormous electoral fraud, which signals, signals are visible till now in, in Nicaragua. This was a public fraud. But uh, the problem is, is uh, to, to put all those voters together. Um, now, there are different political parties that take a quota of those uh, voters, uh, but uh, last time all voters were together were in the municipal election. We're going to see if in the future they, they can be together, but 
uh, it is, mo it is uh, really difficult that we are not going to have a new electoral fraud in the presidential elections in two years. Um, I, I am afraid that people in these conditions are not going to, to show in the, in the wallets. Um, hi. Uh, I just wanted to know, where are you living these days, I guess, other than Boston after the semester? And uh, what are you doing to oppose Ortega? Mm, well, I will be in, in, in Harvard till the beginning of December when I am returning to, to Nicaragua. Uh, I am mainly a writer. I am not participating anymore in politics. That, is, that doesn't mean that I don't give my opinions. And that I don't uh, speak publicly and freely, criticizing <coughs> the government and criticizing Ortega. Till now, I really don't know how, who, what is going to happen in the, in the future if I are going to have the possibility to live in Nicaragua and to exercise my critic against the government in Nicaragua. I really don't know because uh, repression is uh, hardening now in the country. Public manifestations are repressed by mobs in the streets. And uh, I really don't know if uh, we, we, the critics of the, of the government, could in the future be free to express our critics. I really don't know. Uh, students. I just wanted to ask, uh, do you have a, any kind of a free press in uh, Nicaragua? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Uh, we have the, the, two, the, the, the two papers in, the, in the, the country, La Prensa and El Diario, both uh, have a very critical position against the, the government. For the government, it's uh, easier to take uh, re actions of repression against the TV programs and radio programs because they depend, to operate, they, uh, they, they depend on licenses, public licenses, they must receive every, every five or four years. And then under the threat of being uh, uh, suspended from those licenses, licenses, I think they are afraid, uh, but not the papers, not the papers, till now. <coughs> I'd like to ask what, if you could answer this, what you think U.S. policy today should be toward Nicaragua, mm. given our wonderful history? Mm. Well, I don't see the government of the United States is supporting a new dictatorship in Nicaragua now. I, they are not supporting Ortega. They are, I, I, I think, sup uh, opposing opposing uh, uh, Ortega. And uh, two weeks ago, there was a demonstration of the mobs controlled by Ortega and the government against the American embassy in Managua because some statements on the part of the ambassador for this uh, intempestive reform of the Constitution on the part of the Supreme Court. And then they were accusing, accusing the ambassador of uh, intervening in the, in the internal situation of the country and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, there was a program, very important program, uh, developed in the western part of the country, the Millennium Program, I, I think it is the name, the Millennium Program which uh, was designed to build infrastructure and to assist uh, peasants in technical matters and so on. And the government of the United States uh, canceled this program last uh, this year because of the fraud of the elections, municipal elections uh, uh, last year. That, this is the, that is the real situation. And the government of the United States has been against the coup d'etat in, in, in Honduras. Uh, uh, also, uh, 
I really don't know. We must have a very constructive relationship, uh, not uh, seeing to the past, but to, but to the future. Uh, I, of course, the, the, the policies of uh, President Obama shouldn't be the policies of uh, President Bush or President Reagan in the 80s. I'm curious how worried you are that if uh, another dictatorship cannot be stopped by the democratic process that it would devolve into another revolution in the streets by the people. I wouldn't want such a, such a development. Uh, you know, of the revolution first in the 70s and the, and the war against the Contras cost some 40,000 deaths. It was the toll we pay in the, the country to be right to Somoza and to, to, fight the, to fight the Contras. Uh, I hope this situation is going to be solved uh, peacefully. This is my hope, to, uh, to, to, to show Ortega the majority of the people want democracy and is against any kind of uh, dictatorship. And, uh, and I, I think it could be done through civic protest in the streets, massive protest in the, in the street, but, 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 but not by, uh, through any kind of uh, bloodshed again. How do you think NAFTA has affected the humanitarian situation in your country? I think NAFTA is a little marginal in Nicaragua. There, there, there are some sports that are, have been given at, in, uh, from Nicaragua to the state, textiles and so on that are under those quotas, free trade with the United States. But it is not changing very, in, in a very radical form the economic situation of the country. Um, and the Nicaragua is not a rich country, you know, then uh, on the other place, uh, the country is not taking advantage of all the advantages the, the treaty is offering the country because it's not, not had the, the economic capacity to, to do that. Yes. Well, um, first, thanks so much for coming once again. Thank you. And I guess my question would be, you mentioned earlier that um, you would prefer a peaceful revolution. and. I was wondering what steps do you think could be taken? Like, is there a way to make ensure a clean election or anything that really could help in that situation? Well, you know, when somebody's planning to, to put an end to democracy, to falsify electoral results, to reform the Constitution in such a dirty way, uh, this somebody is not thinking that the uh, people is going to react. It is not in his or her calculations uh, to, to see that people is going to react. And, and the people in Nicaragua is going to, is going to react because uh, democracy is essential to the country now. And I don't see people accepting to live under a new dictatorship of, for the next 20 or 30 years. That would be, that would be impossible. That's all, that, that, that are not the, the times now. Those are, those are, these are times of, for different things, for democracy, for liberty in Latin America. Yes, a, a question. There was so much hope in the late 70s and the early 80s with the Nicaraguan Revolution. And many people, I wish there had been more, but many people in the states um, really supported that in all sorts of solidarity efforts. And some of that continues today, which is yes, very I know. laudable. I know. From this area itself, there are several groups that I know are participating in support of community development activities. But I'm wondering about, it's a what if question. And it's thinking about the evolution of the Sandinista party and different turning points that might have changed the direction of the outcomes and might have changed what's happened right now. And I'm thinking, for example, in your book, Adios Muchachos, there is a scene that was to me very compelling, and it's a scene when the Frente Sandinista and the National Directorate of the Frente, 
the nine men were coming together to think about who is going to become the head of the army at the very beginning of the revolution in 1980, I guess, 1979. And there were two people, really, that seemed to surface. One was a very modest man who was named Modesto and who, instead of Modesto taking that position, Umberto Ortega got that position because he raised his hand and said, I accept, even though no one had asked him. Mm -hmm. And he was Daniel Ortega's brother. Yes. And so that was a turning point to me in the history and the evolution. And I wonder if there were other turning points in that history that might have made a difference. Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, Sandinism uh, is a permanent force in Nicaraguan history. I don't see the Sandinism disappearing and um, being repulsed by other kind of political force. <coughs> Sandinism in the future will be reunited and uh, will be a democratic big party to try to balance the, the, the political scope in the country. Nicaragua is going to be a right, of course, and it's going to be a democratic left, and this democratic left is going to be a uh, reshape Sandinism in the future. That is my hope. Hi. Um, sorry, I can't really talk, but I was just wondering. Um, I know in the revolution in 1979, um, students were a huge part of it, both um, in their ideological ties to the FSLN and in the fact that they organized a lot of the mass protests. Um, with sort of the rising, um, kind of bubbling opposition to Ortega, what role are students playing now and what role do you see them playing in the future, particularly if there was um, voter fraud in the next election or something like that? I, I didn't get very well the, the question. Did, did you get the question? Yeah. Uh, just about the role of students. Do you see students playing a greater role in that? Yes, the, the, the universities, are under the public universities are under the tight control of the of the government, and the student organizations too uh, are controlled by the uh, by the uh, party, the, the party in government. But there is an enormous unrest uh, in the in the student population in the in the country, and they are against uh, any kind of dictatorship, and uh, they are pro democracy. I ensure. And they are going to be a very key force in a future struggle for democracy in Nicaragua, in all universities, both private and, uh, and public universities. Um, you mentioned that war is not the answer to poverty and also how um, this presidency is not really true democracy. What do you see as the biggest negative the most negative social consequence of this potential dicta dictatorship in this, this government? Isol international isolation. It is always uh, going on now, this isolation. Uh, some governments are retiring the financial support for the, for the country, like the European Union, for example, the government of the United States. And uh, after isolation, economic uh, crisis, the agudization of uh, poverty, uh, unemployment, that are, that's, th those are the consequences of the lack of uh, democracy uh, in, in for, for, for a country like Nicaragua today. I wanted to uh, ask a question. Please, you are already right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just move over here. Um, actually, I wanted to ask two questions. Um, you had spoken earlier today about the oil that uh, Venezuela is providing to Nicaragua. And I was wondering if you could describe that, what you said earlier. And But my question is whether or not, somehow or another, if that oil um, generosity on the part of um, Chavez is removed, if that would really uh, cause the collapse of the economy uh, in Nicaragua. And the second question I wanted to ask is, you know, I, I'm a student of the former Soviet Union, not Latin America, 
But in the former Soviet Union, there have been what, what we've called the, the color revolutions. There's been the Rose Revolution in Georgia, uh, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Uh, and those have occurred where you know, conditions are, are somewhat similar, uh, but where the opposition you know, has united and where there has been you know, some involvement of, of Western democracy advisors you know, to advise um, you know, the local political parties on tactics that have succeeded in places like Serbia. And I was wondering uh, if you could see the possibility of that happening uh, in, in Nicaragua as well, a, a sort of a color revolution similar to what's happened in Europe. <coughs> Concerning your, your last question, it is pre precisely what I think is going to happen. A, a peaceful movement in the streets, a very colorful and peaceful, peaceful movement in the streets are going to remove this uh, kind of government we have. And um, I, I, I think the next elections in two years are going to be decisive for in this, uh, in this situation because People impede to go to express the, their vote, their opinion in the polls. Uh, people wouldn't like that situation to be suppressed of this uh, of this right. Then we are going to have developments in the next uh, two years, decisive developments in the next two years, <coughs> I think. Uh, concerning Venezuela. Uh, the country needs, Nicaragua needs uh, some 10 billion uh, barrels of oil per, per year. It represents uh, some $800 million. $800 million, the, the barrel of oil is now 70, 75, some $800 million. And the, the half of this amount of money goes directly to the hands of Ortega because uh, in accordance with the agreement signed with Venezuela, 50% of the, of the oil uh, is uh, used by the recipient country for social and development programs. But I was explaining during my lecture, uh, this money doesn't go to the uh, public uh, treasure, but goes directly to a company under the hands uh, of, uh, of, of Ortega. It is a lot of money, four, $400 million per year, to be spent as uh, Ortega wants. Uh, he used this money to help people. He used this money to, ro to build roads in poor areas, but uh, he used this money for private uh, business too, because no, no, nobody is controlling. It is a very bizarre situation. Nobody is controlling him in the using of this money. And it is the money which the country is going to pay someday to Venezuela. Because it's, it's, it is part of the external debt. In the, in the accounts of Venezuela, it is uh, it's inscribed as, as uh, external debt, not for Ortega. And the, 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 the country has not control of this. Uh, of this enormous amount of, of money. I think we're done. Yep, good question over here. Um, in regards to the money that Venezuela has supported with Nicaragua, a group of us did visit one of the hospitals in Managua last year, and we did see the wonderful CT scan um, that was donated, and that was really getting a lot of use. So at least we saw at least a glimmer there. Um, of some utility to the people. I'm just mentioning that because we observed it ourselves. Um, I'm very curious, in addition to Venezuela, who are the main donor countries for Nicaragua right now? Um, I don't know how much U.S. support you're getting. You mentioned the EU a few minutes ago. Um, where does that stand? And we, we were just very struck with the lack of infrastructure mm -hmm. right now. I mean, the from the rebuilding of Managua to the lack of roads and then in the poor communities mm. where we spend our time, just the utter lack of mm. education and other resources. So I'm very interested in development and diplomacy in that mm. linkage. If I can remember, uh, this uh, Millennium Program from the part of the United States uh, was for about $300 million. And there are uh, some $100 million on the part of the uh, 
uh, Agency for International Development of the United States. And then there is the European Union, contributing with some $150. And the different countries of the European Union, principally Spain, which is a very big donator for, to Nicaragua, that I financing, for example, Spain now, the rebuilding of the La Chureca in Managua, which uh, has to do with this uh, disposal site. Uh, it is about for about 60, 60 million euros. And uh, then you have the International Monetary Fund with uh, loans, uh, soft loans, for the, and the International Development Bank and uh, World Bank too. All of this amount, uh, perhaps some $800 million per year. Um, the national budgets uh, depends in it 20% perhaps on international donations. Hi. Uh, yeah, so you were just talking about the IMF and the World Bank now uh, in terms of its activities in Nicaragua. I was wondering if the IMF and World Bank um, helped Nicaragua while Somoza was still in power, and if so, how that affected, I guess, your efforts when you guys were still in the opposition. Um, well, you know that the, the, the opinion of the International Monetary Fund is key for other international financial organizations to help or not to help. And now the, 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 the International Monetary Fund was negotiating with the government an agreement for, that includes the <laughs> stabilization of the national budget, that includes uh, some laws that the, the country must pass concerning the economic financial situation of the, of the country. And the, and the government has uh, complied with all, with all the demands on the part of the International Monetary Fund and then they have approved the program for next for this year, and then they are going to disembolse this uh, money, which is about 140 million dollars. Then the the government is in, in in very good terms, I will say, with the international uh, monetary fund. Uh, hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the corruption level because it seems like there's a lot of money going in. And so if you could talk a little bit about that in terms of, ha and how that affects mm. the effectiveness of e NGOs and so on. Well, you know, there are, we're talking about $500 million coming direct from, from Venezuela through oil. With this money, the country would solve many of its budgetary problems. Uh, problems. For example, all the, the budgetary deficit will be solved with such an amount of, 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 of money. The problem with, with this money from the Venezuelan oil is that nobody controls it. And it is going freely into the hands of uh, the, the president, his family. They are, uh, I said before, helping people. Of course, they are helping people both uh, in a populist way, but they are uh, expending this money in their own benefit too. They are buying hotels. There was a recent case uh, concerning a hotel owned in Managua by, by the Florida Indians of uh, huh? Seminole, by the Seminole tribe from Florida. And the Seminole uh, sold, sold this uh, hotel to, to, the, to, to Ortega with, that bought it with the money from the Venezuelan oil, but he bought it for, for himself and for his family. No, uh, everyone knows it in, in Managua. And they, the, the Seminoles own two, uh, a farm, a experimental farm, and they, they, it was uh, uh, sold to, to, to Ortega too. And Ortega is controlling with this same money all the distribution of oil in, in, in Managua, of gas and oil in Managua. He, he's very quickly building a fortune, like in the case of, of Somoza. Only thing that Somoza spent, the Somoza's family spent almost half a century to build an enormous fortune, and 
the Ortega's family is building this fortune in a very few years. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.